Alcatraz was symbolic in the rebirth of Indian people to be recognized as a people, as human beings. We were not recognized, we were not legitimate, but we were able to raise not only the consciousness of other American people, but our own people as well. European colonists and American native Indians have clashed since explorers arrived in the 1600s. Countless wars over land raged throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, while U.S. federal policy shifted from extermination of Indians to assimilation. Beginning in the 1950s, government relocation and termination policies encouraged Indian movement away from reservations and into cities. The goal was to force the Indians to integrate into mainstream society, resulting in the destruction of their tribes, beliefs, cultures, and religious practices. Relocated Indians who were lonely and confused organized to interact with one another and keep their culture alive. In San Francisco, the hotbed of revolution, Indians formed cultural groups such as the Pomo Club, the Intertribal Dancers, and the Navajo Club. In 1962, these groups came together to form the United Bay Area Council of American Indian Affairs, which would eventually generate the idea to occupy Alcatraz, an abandoned island prison in the San Francisco Bay, under leadership of Adam Fortunate Eagle. I organized these groups to make a collective voice for our people in 1962 to at least develop uh, local programs. In 1964, the Sioux tribe occupied Alcatraz, claiming it was their land according to the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, which stated that all retired, abandoned, and out-of-use federal lands belonged to the Sioux. The federal government, however, denied the Sioux's ownership of the island. Four years later, the United Council sought to buy Alcatraz and reclaim it peacefully after the land was declared surplus property to the city of San Francisco. When the San Francisco Indian Center was mysteriously destroyed in a fire on October 10, 1969, hopes for peaceful negotiation turned to a push for decisive action. The United Council recruited Richard Oakes, a 27-year-old Mohawk Indian studying at San Francisco State University, to unite the older and younger generations of Indians to the Alcatraz cause. With the enthusiasm from Oakes and the inspirational ideas from Adam Fortune Eagle, the Indians decided to occupy Alcatraz as satire for the similarity between the awful conditions on the island and on the reservations. The occupants' goal was to prompt reforms for the future and gain funding for a university and a cultural complex. On the morning of November 20th, 1969, after two failed attempts, 79 Indians successfully disembarked on the island. They established headquarters and celebrated their landing with a victory powwow and ceremonial dancing. This marked the beginning of a 19-month revolution that captivated the nation and culminated in significant reforms in U.S. government policy toward Indians. Shortly after the Indians' arrival on Alcatraz, the government ordered protesters to disperse within 24 hours, but the Indians refused to leave. The Coast Guard set up a blockade to prevent supplies and additional supporters from reaching the island. Richard Oakes addressed the San Francisco Department of Interior. We invite the United States to acknowledge the justice of our claim. The choice now lies with the leaders of the American government to use violence upon us or to institute a real change in its dealing with the American Indian. The revolutionaries elected a governing council founded on popular democracy. On Thanksgiving Day, hundreds of Indians evaded the Coast Guard blockade and joined their fellow people at Alcatraz. In order to heighten media attention, the occupiers published a nationally distributed newsletter called Indians of All Tribes, and in December 1969, Occupier John Trudell began daily broadcasts from the island to radio stations in Berkeley and Los Angeles. As word of the occupation spread, the nation reacted with strong support for the occupiers. Businesses and private citizens donated money, food, and supplies, and many celebrities visited the island in a symbol of solidarity with the occupiers. The rock band Credence Clearwater Revival donated $15,000 to the cause. 
Thousands of messages were sent to governors, Bureau of Indian Affairs officials, members of Congress, and the White House in support of the Indian occupation. Newspapers throughout the country covered the events on the island and kept the citizens informed and interested in the fate of the occupants. With strong public support for the Indian cause and positive media coverage, the federal government finally met with the Alcatraz occupiers, but both sides were unwilling to give up their respective claims to the island. Thus, the government waited, hoping that the harsh conditions on Alcatraz would force the Indians to leave. In December 1969, the government pulled electrical power from the island and disconnected incoming phone lines. Water and fuel supplies diminished. In early January 1970, Oak's 13-year-old stepdaughter died after a serious fall and he left the island, taking with him his powerful leadership. Six months into the occupation, a fire on the island, thought by some to be arson, destroyed three buildings and damaged the lighthouse. Despite these obstacles, July 8, 1970 brought a major victory when President Nixon announced a new policy of self-determination without termination for Indians. Which gave tribal governments more authority and more autonomy to run their own affairs as opposed to having the Bureau of Indian Affairs run everything for us. So we were getting out of the paternalistic cycle of government-to-government relationship. As the end of July approached, public support for the occupation began to wane. The lack of electricity made the lighthouse and fog signals on Alcatraz inoperable, causing concern about the safety of navigation in the San Francisco Bay waters. After an Indian arrow struck a crowded harbor excursion boat, public support decreased further. In January 1971, 13 months after the occupation began, two supertankers collided near the Golden Gate Bridge due to the non-functional navigation aids on the island. On June 11, 1971, after 19 long months of perseverance, a large force of federal marshals, federal protective officers, a security arm of General Services Administration, Coast Guard officials, and FBI agents forcibly removed the final 15 Indians from the island. The revolutionary occupation of Alcatraz had officially ended. Although the 1969 Indian occupation of Alcatraz failed in achieving ownership of the island for Indians, it was successful in ushering in a period of tremendous reform of Indian policy. We won the most important victory for Indians in the 20th century. Millions of acres of land were returned to Indian tribes, and by the end of 1971, the Nixon administration had adopted 52 legislative reforms supporting tribal self-rule, encouraging cultural survival, and promoting economic development on reservations. Additionally, the Bureau of Indian Affairs budget more than doubled and the Indian Financing Act created the Indian Business Development Program to provide loans for Indians. The government expanded educational opportunities for Indians by providing scholarships, and American Indian Studies programs were created at universities throughout the country. Indian health care also expanded with the Johnson O'Malley Act and the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. Along with reform in government policy towards Indians, the occupation inspired many future demonstrations advocating for Indian rights, such as the Trail of Broken Treaties and the Bureau of Indian Affairs occupation in 1972, the second Wounded Knee Incident in 1973, and the Longest Walk in 1978. The occupation of Alcatraz also sparked interest in the American Indian movement and inspired the seizing of federal facilities as national protest actions in future years. The revolutionary 1969 occupation of Alcatraz achieved something no other Indian action had ever achieved before. It stimulated extraordinary reactions from the federal government and the American people catapulted Indians' rights issues to the forefront of the national consciousness, brought about substantial reform in Indian policy, and forever changed the history of Indian-American relations.